Mike Stonebreaker, my friend, for about three decades. For those of you uh, who don't know what a Turing Award is, think of it as the Nobel Prize in Computer Science. So Mike got the award in 2014. And he is a phenomenal guy in terms of uh, being an academician as well as an entrepreneur. He started out at Berkeley and then retired from Berkeley for a short while. He was a CTO for Informix, following which uh, he moved to the East Coast and became an adjunct professor at um, MIT. And that's where he is right now. And during his academic tenures, both at Berkeley and MIT, he has started a number of companies. Currently, uh, he's a CTO, I believe, of Tamer, T-A-M-R. Uh, but there are many other companies, so I strongly suggest that you guys go look at his uh, bio data uh, and also look at the Wikipedia. So let's have the video going now. Well, thank you for letting me present to you remotely uh, via video. Uh, I would be here, I would be there in person, except I dislocated my hip, and the doctor said, "Don't do not travel." So uh, that's why I'm not there. Uh, what I want to tell you about is big data disruption and the 800-pound gorilla in the corner. So what exactly does big data mean? Well, most people think of it as three Vs. Uh, you either have a big data problem because you've got too much of it, you've got a volume problem, or you've got uh, a big data problem because it's coming at you too fast, you have a velocity problem. Or you have a big data problem because it's coming at you from too many places and you have a big variety data integration problem. We'll talk about the three V's uh, and I will uh, decompose the first V into two subclasses. One is that you want to do business intelligence on lots and lots of data which is SQL style analytics. And the second uh, category is that you want to do uh, complex non-SQL analytics on a lot of data. So we're going to uh, limp through these four possible cases, starting with the first one. So if you want to do uh, terabytes of data and you want to do SQL analytics, uh, stuff like the business intelligence products do, uh, that's well addressed by the data warehouse crowd these days. Uh, they are all converging on multi-node uh, column stores, sophisticated compression, and they're very good at doing SQL on hundreds of nodes and petabytes of data. So I know 20 or so production data warehouses in the multi-petabyte range from a variety of vendors. So I consider this problem to be pretty much solved. So what possible storm clouds are there in, in this world? Uh, well, I think there is four of them. The first three are not very interesting. Uh, Non-volatile RAM uh, is going to be coming. Uh, that may have uh, implications for the storage hierarchy in multi-petabyte databases. I don't see any great difficulty in the current vendors adapting to NVRAM. Uh, second thing is networking is getting really fast and it's no longer the high pole in the tent. So uh, all of the current data warehouse vendors try very hard uh, to keep from moving data around. Uh, and so uh, they will have more flexibility in how data gets laid out. But again, I don't see this as a huge disruption. The third one is that all of the money in the data warehouse market is at the high end. So if you have a terabyte or less, uh, Vertica is free uh, for a terabyte. So uh, if you've got a small, smallish data warehouse, you don't, you know, it'll be basically free. And so the petabyte uh, size warehouses is where these guys are making all their money. And the good news for them is that more and more of you have more and more data that you want to run SQL analytics on. So uh, that doesn't seem to me to be an insurmountable issue. But the thing I think that is going to be a huge disruption is that these guys are all solving yesterday's problem. Uh, what's going to happen is as soon as we can train enough data scientists data science is going to replace business intelligence. 
So what does that mean? Uh, it means things like if you run business uh, intelligence on you know, terabytes of data, you'll get a big table of numbers. On the other hand, if you hand the same problem to a data scientist, he'll build you a predictive model and the model will predict whatever you're interested in. So would you rather have a predictive model or a big table of numbers? Most people would take the predictive model. So as soon as we have a stable of data scientists, the technology is going to change. So what do data scientists do? Uh, they do a loop until they get bored or tired. Uh, they condition some data to figure out what they're interested in. And then they run a stable of tools that go by names like regression, data clustering, uh, Bayesian analysis, predictive modeling, dot, 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 dot. So that's what they do. This is not SQL. So the complex analytics they run, none of it is SQL. It is all, uh, well, it's mostly array-based calculations. There's a little bit of graph-based calculations, but it is not table-based calculations. So the data management is SQL-style stuff, and then uh, coupled with much more complicated analytics, which is not in SQL. So how are we going to support data science? So this is the second half of you've got too much data. You want to do, you want to support data scientists who want to run uh, array-based analytics. So there's two ways you can do it. The first way is you can move the data uh, to the computation. Now the data is terabytes or petabytes, and the query is kilobytes. So if you're running R or Spark, uh, coupled with whatever data storage system you're interested in, uh, this is the architecture you're going to propose. Move the data to the query. On the other hand, 100% of the DBMS folks will say that's the wrong way to do it. You always want to move something small to something big. So you want to move the query kilobytes to the data terabytes. That means you want to run the analytics in the database system, not in some user program uh, sort of quite a ways away from the DBMS. So then the question is, what kind of a database system do you want if your analytics are array-based? So you could have a new uh, DBMS that's array-based. You could try and shoehorn array calculations in SQL-based DBMSs. Uh, there's a lot of question on exactly how to support data science. And in my opinion, this is kind of the Wild West. But right now, uh, what the market seems to be telling us is that Spark is the answer. Now, in my opinion, Spark is not the answer. Uh, number one, there's no persistence in Spark. You've got to couple it with something that's going to store your data. Uh, if you've got terabytes or petabytes of data, chances are you've got uh, a few users sharing that data. In Spark, if you and I are both using the same data, we get two copies in main memory, uh, not what you want to do at all. And this will run wildly slower than if you do in-database analytics because you have to copy petabytes uh, from the database system into user space, perhaps across the network. And you've got to do format conversion from what the database wants to what Spark wants. So unless you have just gigantic amounts of data, the conversion is going to be the high pole in the tent, and you're going to be way better off within database analytics. Uh, if you've got gigantic amounts of data, Spark is a main memory system, and you're going to run out of main memory. So in general, I think in database analytics are what to bet on, and Spark is betting the other way. So if you want to look at how this might work, uh, SciDB, which is an array-based uh, DBMS, uh, has an adapter for R. What it does is it scarfs off R calculations, moves them into the database system, and does them in parallel within database analytics. So check out uh, SciDBR uh, for, you know, in my opinion, a better way to do complex analytics. 
Now, the, what I've just told you about Spark isn't uh, something people don't understand. And Spark is a rapidly moving target. So who knows what Spark is going to look like next year. In my opinion, this whole market is the Wild West. Uh, it's ripe for opportunity and disruption. Now, I should mention Hadoop. Uh, Hadoop was yesterday's uh, poster child for how to do analytics. As near as I can tell, Hadoop is dead. Uh, and the Hadoop vendors are now selling HDFS, which is a file system. And in general, HDFS is marketed as a data lake. So stay tuned. I'll have more to say about data lakes in a moment. But Hadoop, uh, meaning the MapReduce clone, uh, I think is yesterday's news. OK, let's move on to big velocity, which is the data is coming at you too fast. Now, there are two user patterns to people who've got big velocity problems. And I'll deal with both of them by talking about electronic trading, because it's easy for you guys to all understand. So the first one is you're trying to do electronic trading, which is you're looking for a pattern in this fire hose of trades. Uh, you can think of this as find me a banana uh, that's within 100 milliseconds of a strawberry. So you're looking for a pattern in a fire hose. And complex event processing uh, is pretty good at doing this. Uh, products are Storm, Kafka, uh, Streambase, dot, dot, dot. But there's another uh, user template, uh, which is there's a large electronic trading company that has uh, trading desks around the world. Think Tokyo, Hong Kong, New York, London. And they're doing electronic trading. And the CEO of this company wants to com compute in real time his exposure for or against every security on the planet so that he can ring the red telephone if he's got too much risk. So he wants to get in a message uh, every time there's a trade anywhere in the world and construct his current position for or against every stock. So this looks like high performance OLTP and is in the wheelhouse of what are called the new SQL vendors. So they are high speed transaction processing systems, typically main memory DBMSs. So there's two, uh, two templates. And in my opinion, these two templates will duke it out for the market. And in my opinion, exactly once uh, message processing semantics with high availability is what is going to become uh, what people demand. That stuff already comes with the second template, the ones, uh, the new SQL engines, generally doesn't come with stream processing systems. Uh, anyway, in this market, there are two approaches, uh, lots, of, uh, lots of argument about how to do it. And again, it gives you the, the feeling that there's an opportunity and possible disruption here. So in this market, uh, a couple things are happening that are interesting. First is RDMA. So uh, you can buy this as a networking, uh, networking hardware. And it enables new ways to do concurrency control, which is required for exactly once semantics. Uh, second thing that's kind of interesting is Google introduced a system called Spanner, which gives you transactional replicas over a, high, a wide area network. Again, it's something that is really interesting. And the availability of higher speed wide area networking uh, possibly enables this. So there's some storm clouds on the horizon, possible disruption, and a lot of argument on exactly how to do uh, this kind of market. But neither of these is the 800 pound gorilla. Uh, that's the big variety space. So a typical large enterprise has 5,000 operational data systems. Big enterprise has 10,000. You ask uh, the typical data warehouse guy how many of these data sources get into his warehouse. Usually he'll tell you about 20. So what about the remaining 4,980? 
And also, what about uh, spreadsheet data? Because chances are the CFO uh, has your company's budget on a spreadsheet, uh, web pages, access databases. And increasingly, enterprises want to integrate public data from the web. So uh, you've got a lot of data sources, only some of which get into the warehouse. So what's the traditional wisdom for how to do data integration? Uh, it's called Extract, Transform, and Load. Uh, it's available from a variety of vendors. Probably the biggest one is Informatica. Uh, also data, data Stage from IBM. So what the technology is, is you have a wizard who constructs a global schema in advance. And for every local data source that you want to integrate, you send a programmer out to understand the data source, map the data uh, to the global schema, and figure out how to clean it, how to dedupe it, and so forth. Uh, this, is, uh, data, this is manual, labor-intensive, and it works for maybe 20 data sources. It's not going to work for a lot of data sources. So who's got a lot of data sources? Well, I know of one large manufacturing enterprise. Uh, every time you want to buy paper clips, you have to deal with a procurement system. This enterprise has 325 procurement systems, all developed independently. This company is very siloed, very divisionalized, and every division has its own procurement system. The CFO estimated that the company could save $100 million a year by just having every one of these procurement officers, uh, when he has to renew his contract for paper clips, if he can find out what terms the other 324 purchasing officers managed to negotiate and then demand most favored nation status, he'd save $100 million a year. Now, all, it's not in paper clips, it's all in the long tail. So there's a lot of money by integrating 325 independently written procurement systems. Think of the, this as 325 supplier databases all built independently. Uh, I know of another large drug company that has about 10,000 bench scientists doing wet chemistry and biology. Uh, that company wants to integrate the electronic lab notebooks of 10,000 bench scientists. So think of these as 10,000 spreadsheets, put them together into an integrated whole. Again, way more than 20 data sources. Uh, a third example is a large automobile company that is you know, a global company, but their European subsidiary wants to integrate customer databases everywhere in Europe. Now, there's at least a customer database for every country, and in, in countries like Germany, it's at, it's at a finer granularity. So I'm not sure exactly how many customer databases there are, but they're in 40 languages, so there are at least 40 of them and probably a few hundred. And the whole idea is that if you have uh, this vendor's or this auto company's, one of these auto company's cars, and you move from Spain to France, they want to know who you are so that they can service you appropriately. So again, uh, because large enterprises are siloed and because uh, they want to do cross-selling, they want to keep track of their customers, et cetera, et cetera, uh, large enterprises want to put together uh, a much larger number of data sources than 20. So how do you put together data sources? Well, you have to do what's called data curation or data integration. You First of all, you have to ingest the data into some common place. You've got to transform uh, data elements uh, between units, so for example, euros to dollars. Uh, data cleaning is a huge deal. So in its simplest form, data cleaning is, well, uh, some people put in minus 99 when what they mean is null, so you've got to fix that up. You've got to map the attributes, uh, so your salary is my wages. We have to normalize that stuff. And then you have to do uh, entity consolidation, duplicate removal. You've got to figure out that Mike Stonebreaker and Michael Stonebreaker are the same thing. 
and, uh, and then consolidate the duplicates. Historically, this has been an Achilles heel. It's incredibly expensive, but incredibly valuable. This is the 800 pound gorilla in the corner. Now, there are a bunch of startups with new ideas in this space. Uh, Tamer is the one I'm associated with, and then there are a bunch of others. In my opinion, this is the Wild West, uh, and it has the advantage that it's, uh, that it's something enterprises really want to do, and they are in terrific pain. Before I finish, I just want to have one slide on data lakes. I mentioned this as re with regard to Hadoop earlier. So in terms of doing data curation, uh, if you have a data lake, then you solve the ingest problem. You can put all, the, all your data sources into one place, but then you've got all the rest of that stuff yet to go. And ingest is at most 5% of the problem, leaving the remaining 95% unsolved. So if you just do a data lake, that creates a data swamp, not a data lake. Or think of it as your enterprise junk drawer. And uh, what you have left to do is data curation, which is the overwhelmingly hard part of the problem. So I have nothing against data lakes. Putting all the data in one place makes perfect sense. But if you think this solves the data integration problem, you are wildly mistaken. So the takeaway from this talk is that uh, there's a wild west in some areas of databases, of big data, uh, and they come with you know, disruption points that creates opportunity, but then always look for enterprise pain, always look for the 800 pound gorilla in the corner when you think about what you're going to spend your time on. Thank you very much.